Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Research is underway by scientists on both sides of Lake Champlain to understand more about a potential threat to human health and aquatic life. Scientists at SUNY Plattsburgh and the University of Vermont's Sea Grant program have joined together to study a growing problem that is already well documented in the world's oceans. Across the fences, Rebecca Gollin has the story. There's a mystery in Lake Champlain. Is it a film? Is it a bead? Is it a fiber, fragment, foam? It is tiny pieces of plastic that researchers started noticing in the early 2000s, first in ocean waters and later in the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain. These particles are less than five millimeters in size. That's smaller than a pencil eraser. The first project and probably the longest running was the wastewater treatment plant processing. So Danielle um, Garneau is a professor of environmental longest, science at SUNY Plattsburgh. The... She's leading a study investigating the distribution of the plastic particles, or microplastics, around the lake, both in the water and also in the animals who live here. We've got invertebrates, uh, macroinvertebrates. We've got 14 species of fish and our top predator would be the cormorants. Um, and so these are all the lake species we've worked with, about 19 species, 14 species specifically are, are fish. The research started several years ago, testing water that was treated at the local wastewater treatment facility. We started doing uh, wastewater treatment plant surveys at the Plattsburgh City plant. Um, we basically will go out with a 355 micron um, sieve and we'll place it under um, a hose that's pulling water from the last um, portion of processing at a plant right before it goes out into the lake. The study recently expanded from Plattsburgh to include wastewater treatment plants in Burlington and St. Albans, with Garneau's team taking samples weekly at each location, as well as several sites within the lake. As you can see from these pie charts, we're getting a lot of fragments, that's in orange here, um, and this is 2015 and 16 samples. One concern is that accumulation of the microplastics in larger fish and predators will have a negative impact on their health. A lot of these plastics have plasticizers and other um, additional you know, additives, the BPA, um, and so on, and those things, are they, are they leaching out into the other tissues, making it through the bloodstream um, and impacting you know, neurologically? And again, findings, early findings in, in many organisms are showing some signs that these aren't necessarily a healthy thing for these organisms. Another piece of the puzzle is determining exactly what kind of plastic each tiny particle came from in the first place. There's so many thousands of kinds of plastics uh, that are out there, different polymers, mm -hmm. different types of plastics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the meander is really that, that S shape yeah. that, that rivers are going to create. Slowing Chris Stepanuk is a professor so and researcher like at the University of Vermont. She's the part of the Lake Champlain Sea well Grant, which is funding Garneau's research on microplastics. What Danielle is finding is that the dominant kind of plastics or microplastics in the lake are fibers. So those are coming from textiles, maybe like our fleece jackets, or from ropes or other uh, plastic materials that are used in the lake or fishing or something like that. Um, and then we also know that she's looking at wastewater treatment plant outfalls and that these microplastics are making their way through the wastewater treatment plants and out into the lake. Garneau's team is also going back to older lake water samples to figure out exactly when the different microplastics started showing up. Knowing the time frame will help them identify where some of the particles are coming from. One source researchers have pinpointed is washing machines. One of the things that we've learned through different research studies is that different kinds of materials, and this is again the fibers being the most prevalent in Lake Champlain, um, when they're washed, they're shedding off pieces of, of plastic, uh, and that's getting again through the wastewater treatment system and out into the lake. The wastewater treatment facilities are not doing anything wrong. They're simply not set up to deal with such small particles. And while a few fibers getting free during a wash may not seem like a big deal, studies have shown that an average size load of polyester cotton blend could release an estimated 
137,000 fibers. Acrylic material, one of the worst offenders, can shed over 700,000 of the microscopic plastic fibers per load. You know, even though when we look at our sieve, when we pull it, it doesn't seem like a lot. You can imagine when we, you know, extrapolate out to, based on flow rates and many thinking about other plants that would be contributing as well, um, this, may, this may become a, a larger problem in the lake. So what can we do? So what we can do is a few things. One is thinking about using fewer plastics. So what kinds of, of action might we have in our lives that uses plastic? Uh, we go to the grocery store. Maybe we don't use the plastic bags. Um, those are films, uh, which would be called plastic microplastic films. Of a plastic bag, bag breaks apart. Uh, she's not seeing those in huge numbers, uh, but that's still an action we can take. There are some products hitting the market that address the problem, like Patagonia's Guppy Friend washing bag and the Cora Ball from the Vermont-based Rosalia project. Long-term solutions could include working with washing machine manufacturers and retrofitting wastewater treatment plants to capture the smaller particles. So in terms of um, what our role can be, you know, just choosing to use um, alternatives or less plastic, you know, don't use the straws, um, switch over to more natural products when we're choosing face wash and toothpaste, you know, be a more aware consumer. That certainly is one of them. Maintenance, maintenance of our um, outerwear and our synthetic clothing. Um, and uh, also if we're, if you um, are out on the lake a lot, you know, making sure that your equipment is up to speed and you're not working with frayed ropes and, and those sorts of things solving a mystery, and rethinking our relationship with the plastic we use and wear. Can we win the war on microplastics? It's going to be challenging. These researchers are up for the challenge and on the case. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollan with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next story focuses on efforts by UVM Extension to help Vermont farmers keep potential pollutants out of the lake. Here's Keith Silva with more on that. A farmer's work is never done. Working on the equipment right now, just putting stuff in the shed, make sure it's ready to go in the spring. Curtis Lane operates Lane Farms, a 300 cow dairy in Bristol. He's the third generation to farm here. Something he's learned growing up in the dairy business is if you're going to make a change, make sure you've done your homework. The previous generation always resists change, which is good because if they didn't, you wouldn't make sure it worked before you did it. You'd be taking unnecessary risks. The advantage I have here with the two previous generations, if, if I'm not guaranteeing it's gonna work, I better be quiet because I'll never hear the end of my failure. Curtis raises crops on 500 of the farm's 900 acres. Almost all of the tillable acreage is considered highly erodible. So any new idea that Curtis brings to the table has to protect the farm's most precious resource, its soil. We all knew we didn't want any of our nutrients to run off because we're paying for them or we're applying them. There's a cost associated with putting them in. If they run off, they do us no good. And if they're getting into the body of water, they're doing it no good. Um, as it's going to take generations to clean up our lake, you know, it's no different than raising a child, it all starts at home. We're gonna look at what we're doing here now and say, if I'm gonna stay in business, I have to be on the edge of what's coming next. Today, you cannot afford not to do this. This is what's gonna protect you from those two inch rainstorms. Starting each January, at multiple locations across the state, really University of Vermont Extension offers a five week course on nutrient management planning to help farmers balance nutrients and meet state and federal reporting standards. I learned a lot about my soils, the makeups of the soils and such things. I knew, oh, this, this field needs this to grow this. But I didn't know exactly what I was putting into it of that, you know. And we were, do we were doing the best practice that we knew of at the time, and now I understand that best practice that we were doing previously was still logical, legit, and accepted. But now if somebody asks me, why are you putting that on that land? I can tell them that it has 
so many pounds oh, yeah. of nitrogen or phosphorus, whatever, then the crop needs this in the soil to remove it. So how do we actually go from this to this? Any ideas? In addition to getting a crash course in soil yeah, science, true. participants develop a nutrient ways. management plan, or NMP, that's tailored to their farm. Matter. Heather Darby is a UVM extension agronomist. Increasing the drainage of your soil. Taking the initiative to write, for a farmer to write their own nutrient management plan is a huge time investment and also a huge responsibility. And so people that actually take this class, they're here on their own free will. Nobody's making them do, that, do this. If they wanted um, a nutrient management plan for their farm, they could hire somebody to develop that plan for them. They don't have to do it on their own. Uh, the farmers that are here are you know, interested in learning uh, more about soils, about how to better grow their crops, what the crops need, how to reduce their impact on the environment. To really educate themselves is part one. And then to get this plan at the very end is, is a benefit of doing that. And farmers are really here because they want to learn. I'm using it as a tool, as you would a wrench. If you plan on taking tires off, you gotta have the right wrench. If I plan on farming, I gotta have the right tools. And this is a tool that I have access to whenever I want it. In order to input data and make up to the minute adjustments to their plans, farmers use a computer software program called GoCrop. The software was developed by UVM Extension. There's also a mobile app so farmers can input information while they're in the field. The nutrient management plan is a current what is happening today. It gives us all the information that we need to make an educated assumption of what we can do the following year based on the results we got in past years. The plans UVM Extension helps farmers develop go beyond the farm. It's a tangible explanation of what a farmer is doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it. For Darby, this kind of knowledge is just as important as having a nutrient management plan. When farmers take the course and you ask them, why are you here, you know, it's, we know regulation is coming. We, you know, we hear that a lot. Um, we want to save money. We, you know, want to improve our crops and the environment. So it has become more mainstream, more people know what it means, including the public. Um, so it's also become a powerful sort of communication tool um, and gives farmers the ability to have something to show um, their neighbors and community. Yeah, saying like, look, I've gone through this really, you know, intensive process to do my best um, by the environment and by my farm and by you, and here it is, you know, and um, and can communicate about it too, especially if they've learned firsthand what it what it all means. And I think people value that as well because knowledge, you know, knowledge is power, and and this gives them more knowledge and more power to really sort of, you know, communicate about the issues that we have in Vermont yeah, today. That. It's really important. Back at Lane Farms, the clearest example that Curtis's plan is working is to look at the water coming off his fields. It's clear. The soil's not washing away, which means the nutrients are staying in place. Credit Curtis's nutrient management plan and the pride he takes as a steward of the land. I use in discussions with people I know things I learned in my nutrient management plan about soil loss and the purpose of the cover crops, the purpose of the sprays, you know, and the purpose of, of the tillage practices and so on and so forth, of what that directly does to the water quality that I have control of. Or I say control of, which is actually an incorrect word. I have responsibility for. Because if that, I, you do not own the water, you own the land around and underneath the water. You have control of that. That has a direct impact on the water, which you don't own. Now that water that is moving through your land, you have a, a responsibility to the environment, to your livestock, to your family, and to the general public, that if we all take care of it, it will be there forever. What's happening at Lane Farms is what's happening across Vermont. Farmers are making plans for today and putting them into practice for tomorrow. In Bristol, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence.
The next round of UVM Extension's nutrient management planning classes begin in January. For more information, you can call 802-524-6501 or check the website uvm.edu slash extension slash cropsoil. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.